Good morning, everybody. How are you doing this morning? Excellent. Wonderful. Well, we're glad that you're up, awake, that you made it through the fog, and that you are here for 90 ideas in 90 minutes. I'm Susanna DeBaca. I'm the president of BPC, and we are just delighted to have you here today. So 90 Ideas in 90 Minutes is one of our favorite events at the Business Record, and it is certainly one of my favorite events here. I think many of you know, because I see so many familiar faces, that most of the time at Business Record, we're pretty much all business. We have economic forecasts, we talk about deals and transactions, and helping you do business better. But doing business better sometimes requires not just concrete, factual data like economic models or recession stress testing, but also ideas and inspiration. So we said, why not turn once again to some of the most brilliant, successful, creative, and visionary leaders and peers right here in Des Moines, as we always do with this event. So the Stellar Business Record editorial team has assembled an outstanding panel right up here of the region's most forward-thinking leaders from both the public and the private sector and really from all walks of life. You are going to hear from top leaders from a variety of industries and careers, from insurance to healthcare to education to art. They're going to be mixing it up around work and life and purpose and meaning. And you've probably seen some of these lines. Wisdom, this is work wisdom, people. Always be home for dinner and go against the corporate mold. Yes, this is a business event, so I really, really like that one. See what I mean? This isn't just an economic forecast. No, 90 Ideas is really about thinking outside the box. It's actually maybe thinking about getting rid of the box, not having a box at all, about dreaming and creating. So we hope that you're going to come away with a few nuggets that will propel your thinking, get your heart beating, and motivate you to be the best and most authentic version of yourself so that you can create a stronger community and a more vibrant world. Because even in business, isn't that really what we're here for? I'm going to clap at that one. Mm -hmm. So before we get started, I am very proud to introduce our presenting sponsor, Denton's Davis Brown, up here at this table. They can clap for themselves. I see that happening. That's absolutely fine, right. That's good team spirit to get us started. Founded in 1929, Denton's Davis Brown grew despite the Great Depression and has continued its growth through other periods of significant economic disruption, social, and generational change. Today, with more than 75 lawyers serving clients in the greater Des Moines region, Denton's Davis Brown lawyers offer practical, useful legal advice to help clients achieve their business goals. Known for academic excellence, creativity, integrity, and motivation, their lawyers have been recognized by Best Lawyers, Super Lawyers, Chambers USA, and as the best law firm in Des Moines for 15 consecutive years. And I am happy to introduce presenting sponsor Denton Davis Brown's uh, shareholder, Tyler Coe, who is one of the leading divorce attorneys here in Des Moines. Tyler. Thank you so much, Susanna. It's great to see you. It's been a while. As Susanna said, I'm Tyler Coe, a partner with Denton's Davis Brown here in Iowa. You know, in my role as a family law attorney, I represent lots of individuals and businesses. From the young couple in need of a premarital agreement to jumpstart their life, to divorcing couples where multi-million dollar businesses and jobs are truly on the line, I understand the necessity to hear, engage, and learn from everyone. As the largest law firm in the world, my practice is but a small part of the overall Denton's firm. We help not only individuals, 
but businesses and entrepreneurs across the state, nation, and globe. These areas touch on healthcare, insurance, employment law, senior living, venture tech, finance, manufacturing, and nearly every area of law you can imagine. You know, change is a constant for everyone, especially law firms. We try to help, and I believe do a really good job, of helping our clients grow, protect, operate, and finance at every stage of a life cycle. Just like the folks you will hear speak today, we understand new ideas are vital to improving our businesses, the lives of our employees, and our communities. That's what matters most. In fact, our purpose statement reads, and I'm really proud of this, by the way, redefine what is possible and shape the future, together, everywhere. And right now, we are all together, we come from everywhere. The backbone of our community depends on our people and these collective ideas. Thank you to our speakers here today. Thank you for everyone showing up. And please know that Denton Davis Brown is here for you. And we look forward to this amazing uh, speak. Thank you. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our supporting sponsor, Broadlands Medical Center. Broadlands, go ahead and clap, Broadlands. Yes, I know, this is good. I'm trying to get you guys primed here. Broadlands is Iowa's only county hospital serving one of the most diverse patient populations in our community. They pri proudly provide quality care to the largest volume of refugees in the state, if you did not know that with over 100 different languages spoken each year on campus, Broadlawn strives to provide culturally competent care to our community, and with us today is President and CEO, Dr. Anthony Coleman. Well, good morning, everyone. Okay, I know it's early. Um, well, first I want to uh, thank and recognize our distinguished uh, panelists and um, our guests and our friends from um, Business Public Publications Corporation. Um, I bring you greetings on behalf of the physicians, the, the staff, and the trustees of Broadlands Medical Center. Um, congr congratulations to you all, panelists. Your work has made room for you on this stage. And um, I was excited to read your ideas this morning. Um, I believe that um, diversity breeds innovation. And so no one has ever arrived. Um, and I think when you, when you um, are awarded positions of power, that's when your work begins. And no one ever has it figured out. I certainly don't. So I appreciate reading your ideas because there were a number of them that I thought, oh, I can use that. So thank you all. At Broadlands Medical Center, we provide world-class care, period. It's not lost on me that maybe 10 or 15 years ago, Broadlands was thought of as the last resort or perhaps maybe the poor people's hospital. It still is the hospital for poor people. It's really the hospital for everyone. But I want to share with you that because of our physicians and our staff and their commitment to always improving the quality of care, we have emerged from being the last resort to a provider of choice. From our fully remodeled labor and delivery suites to our fully remodeled operating rooms to our state-of-the-art robots. Um, we actually, I want to brag on one of my physicians, we have a, a robot, it's a robotic bronchoscopy machine. So what that means is that um, we are able to diagnose lung cancer in its early stage. We weren't able to do that before. And I had the pleasure of scrubbing in on one of these surgeries, and I'll tell you, we've done 21 of them so far, and out of those 21, we've diagnosed 20 um, patients with stage one lung cancer, something we have never been able to do before. So we're bringing state-of-the-art care right here to the residents of Polk County. 
So from our state-of-the-art robots to expanding access to our brand new community clinic at Drake, Broadlawns is redefining what it means to be a county hospital. I said earlier that diversity breeds innovation, and that is true. None of the work that we do could be possible without the business community, without the thoughts of um, the individuals sitting on this stage. So our success as a county hospital is, is the, the county's success and it's you all's success. And we depend on you. We depend on you. We depend on your thoughts. We depend on your ideas. We depend on your feedback because that's what makes us better. So thank you very much for uh, featuring Broadlawns and thank you. Thank you so much to Denton's Davis Brown for being our presenting sponsor and to Broadlands for being our supporting sponsor for this year's 90 Ideas. And now I would like to introduce today's moderators, business publications group publisher Chris Konetsky, who's right over here, and special projects editor Emily Wood, whose team played an integral role in selecting this year's 90 Ideas speakers. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. All right, good morning, everybody. All right, we're already starting to warm up. That's good, because I'm going to ask for a little bit of that today. As Susanna mentioned, this is a little bit different today. We want this to be quick, fast-paced. I've, I've seen some of the speakers have props, even, that they've placed so strategically around here. So I know we have a few surprises as well. Um, and we, want, we have to stick to a strict schedule today because we, have, we want to have an opportunity to ask a few questions at the end to everybody as well and make sure we get through everybody. So here's how the format's going to work today. We're going to call up the speakers one at a time. They're each going to spend their five minutes, and five minutes only, talking about some of their ideas. At the end, we'll have a few questions for the group. As I mentioned, we've got a strict schedule to follow, so each of the nine speakers is going to have five minutes. The speakers are going to, could address all of their ten ideas that are in the magazine, uh, or they might just address a few or one. But at the end of five minutes, we've got a timer that's going to be beeping. They know that uh, uh, we'll have a little stop sign up front. You can see it, so everybody knows where it's at, right? So we can't have any excuses. You couldn't see that we needed to stop. It's right there in front of you. Plus, strategically, I'm sitting right next to you guys, so that'll help. Now, as you know, there's always a risk. If you give somebody a mic and a crowd and a time limit, sometimes they don't follow the rules. And Joshua, I'm already looking at you and you're starting us off. <laughs> we don't like cutting people off in the middle of their award-winning speeches full of wisdom, but if they go over five minutes, we do have a few special, we, we call them incentives. Uh, might, others might call them punishments for our speakers. So speakers, you might be wondering what those are. All I'm going to say is I hope you read our five-page instruction email that we had before this event. Um, I hope you read all the way to the end because we have uh, a few little punishments to dole out if they go over five minutes. So we'll let you know about those before you speak. One last thing, I've got a big ask, two big asks. One, you'll see on front in your tables, you got some snacks and stuff. This is a great time if you want to dig into those and hear all the wrapping and get into that. Go ahead and do that because I need you guys to give a big round of applause to all the panelists. Give them a little bit of encouragement as we go through today. Be nice and loud today. So as our speakers come up, make sure to give them that encouragement. There we go. There's the noise. You dig into those snacks. Um, the, as our speakers come up, feel free to give them big rounds of applause. Give them, do the hooting, do the hollering, do what you need to do to get everybody excited to go. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Joshua is up first. Joshua, yeah, there we go. Joshua Barr. <laughs> Joshua is the chief strategist and president of Raising the Bar, LLC. The organization conducts seminars, dialogues, and workshops designed to cultivate an organization's human capital in order to improve an organization's bottom line and mission. In 2020, he, debu he debuted his Emmy award-winning documentary, Breaking Bread, Building Bridges, that told the story of nearly 40 strangers who were matched up together based on their differences to have dinners over the course of a few months. He previously served as the director of the Des Moines Civil and Human Rights Commission. He was a member of our 2019 40 Under 40 class. And Joshua, your punishment, if you, I'm sorry, incentive, if you go over your time, you're changing your business's name to lowering the bar. <laughs> Please give Joshua a big welcome.
There was a man who heard of a rare bird that could speak five languages and went searching around the world to find this bird. He searched six continents looking for this bird and finally arrived at the last pet store on earth. The bird was not there and he asked the store owner, can you help me locate this rare bird? I've looked everywhere. The, pet, the store owner decided to help him and he identified the bird. It was actually in the man's hometown, the one place he neglected to look. Knowing that the bird was there, he called the pet store owner and said, hey, can you send this bird to my home? And the next day he arrived home and said to his spouse, dear, did the bird come? Yes, his spouse replied. Well, where is it? In the oven. <laughs> and he responded, are you kidding me? Did you not know that that bird could speak five different languages? And his spouse replied, well, why didn't it speak up? <laughs> now, as business leaders, who are you in this story? Are you the bird slowly watching what's happened, having the ability to speak, yet you are silent, slowly watching your own demise? You see, Iowa presently is not meeting its business workforce needs in order to grow and be competitive ranking sit, the bottom six in ethnic diversity and growth is primarily coming from people that don't look like people in this audience. Yet politicians and others are trying to roll back diversity and inclusion efforts in Iowa. Well, I'm here today to tell you can't be neutral on the moving train of life. Business is one leg in a three-legged stool that holds up our society. Government and people are the other two. Businesses are the organs that provide functions and services that make our society work, but a society can't exist without people. And if businesses play the neutral card regarding the plight of people and the opportunities of people, the entire stool of society is going to collapse. In, 20, uh, in, in 2026, the United States is estimated to have an educational enrollment bust in regard to young people enrolling in secondary education. Universities right here in Iowa are going to have a tough time recruiting new students. Is the business community here collaborating with our local colleges and universities to create niche opportunities more relevant to both the needs of the students and the Iowa business community? If you don't have students, eventually you won't have a workforce. How are we working with politicians, both local and state and federal? to help attract good talent and not scare it away with non-welcoming rhetoric? Are you the man in the story, looking all around the world for certain talent when you have that talent right here in your own backyard? We can create internship and apprentice programs to raise up the next generation of workers and leaders in Iowa like Evelyn K. Davis Center is trying to do. They don't, you don't have to leave the state, and those, and those young people don't have to leave the state to build the life that they always wanted to have. We need to invest in all communities that are already here. But are we willing to take the time to cultivate the talents, the passions, and the skills of people right here in the greater Des Moines area? Let's end the, bra the brain drain here in Iowa. Let's map out the future we desire for our communities and work with our chambers of commerce, governments, schools, and civic organizations to make that happen. Or we can continue to spend money and searching far and wide, trying to attract other people who'd rather be on the, on the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. Also, are you communicating your vision to your team? You can be like the spouse in the story, just doing what you think is your role, failing to see the bigger picture. Your leaders are failing to communicate the idea and your role in shaping our communities. Or maybe you're just not asking the right questions because you aren't a leader, but rather you are a docile manager who doesn't ask questions, missing out on great opportunities that come knocking at your door because you've been programmed not to think, but just play a role. Real leaders have a vision and can articulate that vision. Managers just follow instructions. Leaders, if you're in the building, we must show people that Iowa is a place where you can have a great quality of life, and people of all shapes, sizes, and colors are welcome here and can prosper. If you are only here for yourself, we won't get very far. If we want to go far as a community, a region, and a state, we have to go together. Don't be neutral. Get involved in the direction and trajectory of our region and state.
Because if you don't, you've already made a decision on what's important to you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joshua, for getting us started off on a good note. Next, I'd like to introduce Shekinah Fountain, a senior DEI associate at the White's Company. She previously held roles as a global insurance consultant for Principal Financial Group and was a chief communications officer for the city of Des Moines. Earlier this year, she founded her own communications consulting business. Back in 2004, she founded Back to School Iowa, a philanthropic effort focused on inspiring youths in their educational pursuits. She was a member of our 2020 40 Under 40 class. And Shekinah, since you work for a construction company, your incentive to stay on time is if you don't, you'll have to wear high vis for the rest of the year, even when you're not working. No problem. <laughs> Mic check, one, two, one, two. Bueno. <laughs> Let's go, friends. I'm ready. <laughs> That's not a part of my time budget. Good morning, everybody. I am Shekinah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the business record for um, choosing me to assist in this space. Thank you to my fellow panelists that are going to be sharing nuggets of wisdom. Thank you to this vest that is going to unravel in less than five minutes so that I can properly put that on. And we're moving. So um, I am Shekinah. I have been involved in the public and the private sector work in my spare time. When I am not having fun with my husband and my favorite eight-year-old, I am giving my time, talent, and treasure to organizations like Back to School Iowa that help under-resourced youth, and also Lady Like DSM, Professional and Personal Development of Black Women in Our State. What I have found is what's common in all of these spaces is problem-solving skills. I recently joined a new industry, maybe you can tell from my ensemble, <laughs> of construction with the White's company. They are the bomb.com, look them up. Good folks, if I don't say so myself. But what I have found in this new industry is these problem solving skills come in handy. A lot of times when you switch jobs, people ask, what do you do? Like, what does that big title really mean? And I tell them, I build a better way. I work in the office, I don't build much. But the truth is, every whites employee builds a better way. And I'm here to give you the secrets of how we do that in less than five minutes. So, one of the first ways that we do that is to keep your mind right. You have to put on helmets, my smart friends tell me on job sites, in order to keep your mind right. Keeping your mind right is all about knowing the problem, thank you, and knowing the goal. Not getting distracted by outside things. That snaps, not today. <laughs> Another way <laughs> that you do that is by putting on this reflective vest. Not to be like, oh, I'm so cute, look at me, look at me. But what you're really saying is see me. See me for who I am. And I want you to wear your vest so I can see you for who you are. And so we can have psychological safety in the office and on the field because I see you and I can protect you in that way. And I hope that you can protect me too. What you also got to do is put on these handy gloves because anybody building a better way is going to get dirty. Right? And you want to get into good trouble. I'm all about that. <laughs> Last but not least, I hid my little props and I forgot where I hid them. <laughs> you put on glasses because you want to protect your eyes. No, because you want to be cool. You never want to let them see you sweat. In advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion, that can be a challenging role, right? But you're kind of like a duck. Your feet are like, woo, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? But on the top, you're smooth sailing. So my challenge to you is to build a better way. Build a better way in your office. I can't see with these glasses. <laughs> build a better way in your office. Build a better way in your home. Build a better way in your heart. See the problem. Don't ignore the problem. Acknowledge it, right? But don't just talk about it. You got to be about it. Put your helmet on. Keep your mind right. See that problem know the solution, move toward that. 
Put your reflective vest on. It's not about showboating. It's about acknowledging who you are, acknowledging who your neighbors are. Keep your feet together. I didn't talk about my feet. I have on boots. Can you see them? <laughs> Keep your feet together. Sometimes it takes stepping into other people's shoes, centering their perspective and not your own. As a superpower, born and raised in the United States of America, that's a greater challenge for us. But I challenge us all to move in that direction to do that. Get your hands dirty and stay cool with your glasses. I think, so let's go to work. I hate it, I hate it. I know that everywhere, thank you. Nicely done, Shekinah. I think I might need that helmet just in case uh, there's any of uh, the punishments people don't really like so much. <laughs> but good job staying on time. All right, our next speaker is Rochelle Keck. Since, yes, round of applause. <laughs> Since 2022, Rochelle has been the president of Grandview University, the first woman to hold the role. She was president of Briarcliff University in Sioux City before that. She began her career as a prosecutor before establishing her own law firm. She also served on the Wartburg College Board of Regents where she developed a passion for higher education that led to other philanthropy roles in higher ed. She's a first generation college student herself and considers herself a lifelong learner. Rochelle, if you go over your time, I believe we've got the school's mascot costume that you're gonna be wearing all day long. So please make sure you're ready. Please welcome Rochelle. Greetings, learners, and welcome to Future You, the University of Tomorrow. My name is Dr. Rochelle Keck, and I'm the president here. We are called Future You because we are about the future and what you can do about it. Congratulations on your graduation from yesterday, you. You all did a really good job, <laughs> but it's time to level up. And remember, be prepared at all times to shift, to pivot, and to adapt. <clears throat> the future will require it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Quick word association. When I say the word future, what emotions do you feel? Excitement, fear, trepidation, fatigue, terror. We are told that we live in a VUCA world a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Quick history lesson learners, the term VUCA actually came out of the Army War College nearly four decades ago. This VUCA future can either terrify you or energize you. <clears throat> Let's think about the past for a moment. When you were a youngster, were you ever asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? In the past, we focused on learning an occupational identity, a term coined by Heather McGowan in the book, The Adaptation Advantage. In fact, many of our surnames in this country come from that concept, Baker, Mason, Cook. Now let's think about the future, our favorite subject here at Future U. According to New Work Mindset Research, today's graduates will on average have over 17 different careers in over five different industries across their work spans. Many of those jobs have not yet been created. How does one prepare for a future like that? How does a university prepare its graduates for that future? I tell our students two things. One, major in adaptation, and two, Change your VUCA mindset to a VUCA you mindset. Rather than focusing on the world as volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, focus on you. You are versatile, unstoppable, curious, and adaptable. The original VUCA is external and out of your control. VUCA you, however, is about you. It's internal and within your control. It's about your mindset, your attitude, your actions, and your approach to whatever lies ahead. You are versatile, unstoppable, curious, and adaptable. Let me give you some examples. 
First, you could say, there's so much to learn. Or you could say, there's so much to learn. Cheesy, I know. Anyone know the story of David and Goliath in the Bible? We all have giants in our lives, don't we? We don't get to choose those giants, but we get to choose our response to them. The VUCA option, he's so big, I can't win. The VUCA U option, he's so big, I can't miss. Finally, script the Flip the script from thinking that you must achieve a set occupational identity. The question, what do you want to be when you grow up, is no longer relevant. The only answer here at Future You is curious. I want to be curious. Think of learning as an investment in yourself, and the currency is curiosity. You can't rely on Big Brother, your employer, or even your mom to do this for you. You are in control of how you navigate the future, whatever lies ahead. You hold the key, in fact, you are the key to your learning, your adaptation, your meaning, and your joy. What would you like to learn today? And oh, before I forget, you have a slight change to your orientation schedule. At 3 p.m., there will be a pep rally. Go cyborgs! <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Keck. Fortunately, you stayed on time, but I did hear it's homecoming this week, so the mascot might still be in order for you. Next, I want to introduce Caleb Knudsen, a senior planner at Mid-Iowa Planning Alliance, and he's also an entrepreneur. He volunteers as a mentor for an undergraduate planning student at ISU for the Iowa chapter of the American Planning Association. He previously served as a part of the inaugural Iowa Latino Gala Planning Committee and as a commissioner for the Iowa Commission of Latino Affairs. He was a member of this year's 40 Under 40 class, and if you saw the cover of that edition, you might recognize him. Um, if you go over your time, since you have a coffee shop, you have to name a latte after me. Naming lattes is something that I like to do. Most of them get shot down because they're not the best names. So that's a win, an Emily latte. <laughs> anyway, my time has started. Good morning, my name is Caleb. For those of you who don't know me, buckle up. For those of you who do, I am super sorry. <laughs> and to my kids and wife watching this in the future, I uh, can't wait to get home, watch anime, Star Wars, and baking shows. So when I got the email, it was really long. I don't read a lot of long emails, and so I replied, I think it was two words, yeah, sure. <laughs> Second email was about eight paragraphs, so like, oh my gosh, what did I agree to? And then I looked at it, I was like, oh, they want unsolicited advice. I love giving unsolicited <laughs> advice. If you and I talk or text, you've received a text from me, live your life your way, but or I don't want to give you unsolicited advice, but, so I'm super excited. Um, but, you know, to start out, I'm gonna quote General George Washington. Can I be real for a second, for just a millisecond? <laughs> let my guard down and let the people know how I feel for a second. Um, I love Hamilton, if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> I'm always gonna quote Lynn mel, -Mel Miranda. So yesterday I caught a case of imposter syndrome. And a lot of people in that room know what that is. A lot of people of color understand what that is. So I was at my barbershop in Marshalltown, the Latino barbershop, getting a fresh fade, getting my beard done. I don't normally do that, so like, what's up? I was like, oh, I got this event tomorrow. Brief explanation. I'm like, I don't know why they asked me to come up here. And my barber stops, gets the blade away, and she goes, you know why. You just gotta figure it out. So I toiled yesterday afternoon. Why am I here? You know, I'm the dude who's gonna quote Scarface to you, and I'm gonna do it at a business record event, I'm gonna do it again. They didn't learn their lesson at 40 under 40, so <laughs> that's on them. I'm gonna quote Lynn Manuel Miranda. I'm gonna cite Star Wars. But more importantly, I'm gonna be authentic. That's the most important thing we can do, is not encourage people to code switch, 
is the people that we have around us, with us, above us, under us, encourage them to be themselves. You know, I'm always going to be 100. I'm always going to bring that. That's who I am. That's what I want my kids to see. That's what I want the young planners to see, the young developers, and everyone else. I'm not a LinkedIn influencer. I'm not a doctor or a lawyer. I'm just some random Honduran dude. Very privileged to be up here. Um, as you've heard from other speakers, there's a lot of privilege in this room. So what are you using that privilege for? How are you elevating and lifting people up? And so I went through my answers because I didn't remember what I said. Uh, and there's a theme. It's three things. It might be four. We'll find out. Elevate others. Be authentic. And collaborate. That's what we can do. How are you collaborating with people around you? Um, Red Bull Race, he should have gave me a higher score on our design, but we had the rule of four. Look it up, always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> with our coffee shop, our most successful t-shirt has been designed by our college and high school employees. I couldn't design something half as cool. Drip or drown? Uh, you know, I understand drip, but I don't understand how drown applies, but people like it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of good things to do. How are we encouraging people to be themselves? How am I encouraging people to be themselves? Timer, where are we? One minute. Okay, so two closing thoughts. It's Latino Heritage Month, Hispanic Heritage Month. Venmo your Latino friends for lunch. Don't go with them. Let them eat in peace. Don't ask them questions. And as promised, yeah, he gets it. Que pasa so? Uh, in closing, as promised, Sosa, I only have one thing. Let me get this straight. All I have in this world is my huevos and my word, and I don't break them for nobody. You understand? Nicely done, Caleb. I think we'll bring you back for a couple more quotes, so. All right, our next speaker is Liz Legit. Let's give her a big round of applause. Liz is the founder of Liz Legit Gallery and Design. She founded her business as an art advisor in 2012 after working as an in-house curator for a corporate collection. She's a volunteer for many local arts and culture organizations, including the Des Moines Art Center, Des Moines Metro Opera, and Ballet Des Moines. She was a member of the 2012 40 Under 40 class. And Liz, if you go over your time, you have to commission a painting of the entire business record newsroom and hang it in your gallery, and I, I don't think you want that. So. <laughs> Please welcome Liz. Creativity is that ineffable match strike. That flash in the dark that comes from, well, it's hard to say from where. You can't summon it on demand, but directing your mind to the task does help. You can't choose your creative type either. The musician is not an architect, the painter is not a poet, and not all creativity is artistic. That's the genius of an engineer, a surgeon, or a coder. I'd wager a guess that many people in the business world would not consider themselves a creative. As a gallery owner, people who favor numbers and data often say to me, I don't have a creative bone in my body. But here's what I have truly come to believe. Anyone can be creative. It is a muscle to be used and built over time. I have been asked hundreds of times, what makes an object art? And my answer is intention. The artist's intention on whether an object is art is what makes it art. Not what the viewer thinks, not if it's good or bad. None of that matters. What matters is the artist setting the intention to create and therefore making it so. Creativity is similar. If you set the intention to be creative, you will be. Intentionally make time for it, whether it's journaling for 10 minutes a morning or taking a painting class, it can help you see things differently. I remember one particular trip to the City Museum in St. Louis, a place unlike any other that I have been, a maze made up of 10 immersive art experiences. Picture a huge McDonald's play place, but made out of steel and airplanes. 
There are seemingly limitless ways to get from point A to point B in this place. And after I left, I looked at the city around me differently. I was thinking about how I could get to our car. Could I scale the parking garage? Could I find something to shimmy up? Or would I have to go the lame way, the stairs? My brain was temporarily changed by what I had experienced. All of this to say, I believe that business can be as creative as the arts and can learn from them too. We're truly not all that different. Artists begin with a blank sheet of paper and business people, a problem to solve. Both have to experiment, see what works, edit, and keep moving forward until you're done, or at least willing to move on. And those doodles you drew in your notebook in school were actually quite productive. The left side of your brain is for verbal and rational knowledge, and the right side of the brain senses relationships and patterns. So if you're stuck on a problem, I'd suggest you begin to doodle to switch the side of the brain you're using. If you have employees who want to be more creative, consider that good design and art can foster creativity and joy in the workplace. We are all greatly affected by our environments. A survey of more than 800 employees at 32 companies said that art in the workplace helped businesses address challenges like increasing creativity and encouraging expressions of opinions. Art allows us to see the world from different perspectives and makes us more empathetic. And of course, creativity accompanies growth and innovation. My team and I opened the gallery doors in May of 2019. In under a year, we were faced with the pandemic. I had salaries and rent to pay and little initial reserves while feeling responsible for the artists that we represented. In a time that so many businesses folded, what saved us? Creativity and believing that people needed beauty and art to get through a hard time. After the initial shutdown, I started going to the gallery every day to talk on social media, and my team worked around the clock to create a completely shoppable website. I'd show up on video, share my passion for art, and hope that people would connect with what I was saying. It turns out they did connect with the art through their phone screens, and they bought it using that website. But this is not how it's usually done in the art world. Oftentimes, prices are a secret at galleries. If you have to ask, you can't afford it. And sometimes, even if you have the money, you're not allowed to buy the art if you're not deemed the right buyer. But I felt like we could do something different, and that desperate times called for new measures. We created our own best practices and paid little care to how it had always been done. Fast forward to today, and we're about to hit our five-year anniversary. We represent more than 60 artists from around the world. We're on track to ship artwork to all 50 states this year. And we were just named one of the country's top small businesses by the US Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Thanks. I have no doubt that creativity and a willingness to try new things saved my business. In both the arts and business, there is a joy in creating something from nothing, in finding a new way to look at an issue, and using creativity to find the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Up next, we have Dr. Trish Newland, who is the CEO and president of Unity Point Clinic. She has more than two decades of healthcare experience, before her current role, she served as Unity Point Clinic Primary Care Medical Director, and she was also previously the Vice President Medical Director for the Central Iowa Region. She's held other various leadership roles since starting her career as a family medicine resident at Unity Point Health Iowa Lutheran Hospital here in Des Moines. And if you go over your time, since you did med school at Iowa, you have to wear cyclone gear to work for a day. <laughs> Well, joke's on you, because I went to undergrad at Iowa State. <laughs> I learned early on in my career as a physician, not even a leader, that people notice. I was shopping at our fairway in Norwalk with my two young children in tow on a Saturday morning wearing jeans and a sweatshirt. And as every time I go shopping in Norwalk, I bumped into several patients. And most of them just said hello. But there was one woman who did this very deliberate peer into my cart. 
And I know she was looking, are there fruits and vegetables in there like you told me to buy? (laughs) Or are there contraband snacks? And, you know, um, I pushed away slowly and looked down in my cart, and there were the frosted flakes. (laughs) So worse than something that I might eat, it was a sugary cereal that I might feed those children. People notice, and I think that's a really important leadership thing to remember. First and foremost, I think we need to notice ourselves and our own health, both physical and mental. Eating as healthy as you can is really important, and getting plenty of exercise, and hopefully it's something you enjoy. Get good sleep. And don't forget to carve out time for your family and friends. We all learned the hard way during the pandemic just how important it is to keep those social connections. And if you're feeling a little nervous or tense, doing something as simple as taking three deep, slow breaths can make some really cool physiologic things happen in your body and make you feel relaxed. And for my fellow panelists who haven't been up here yet, this might be a good time to do that. (laughs) Secondly, notice your team. Look for those people with talent. I call it a spark. And when I see someone with a spark, I try to figure out where can I give them more opportunity? Can I get them involved in a formal class or put them on a project so that they can grow and shine? Notice when they do something great. Write that handwritten thank you. I keep a big yellow box in my office full of cards to send to folks. Maybe it's just a quick email or a genuine thanks. It's the gratitude that's important. Notice your team. I also think it's important for us to help our colleagues notice each other. And every week I have a senior executive team meeting The first 10 minutes is carved out for what I call reflection. Um, This is a time that sometimes I share a story, sometimes we ask philosophical questions or talk about challenges, and sometimes we all just need to talk about something silly like what was our favorite toy as a child. This time together helps us connect and builds trust and allows us to do more work as a team. Third, acknowledge. People notice. They're going to look in your shopping cart. And hopefully, most of the time, you'll be inspiring and shiny, colorful fruits and vegetables. But sometimes, it's okay for them to see that you, too, get frustrated. And you, too, don't know the answer. And you, too... Struggle when your kid's struggling, or your dog died, and that you might get those tears in your eyes. And that's okay, because it's okay for them to see your frosted flakes. (laughs) And for those of you who are keeping track in your booklet, the very last thing is be punctual and on time. And so with that, I'm going to finish right now before time. Thanks. (laughs) Hope nobody saw my shopping cart the last time I had a couple frozen pizzas in there. So, <laughs> all right, our next speaker is Jeff Rommel. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Jeff is a senior vice president at Nationwide, which is on your side. He was appointed to his current role last month. He started with Nationwide in 1985 as a claims representative with Allied Insurance, a nationwide company. He's held various leadership roles with the organization. He currently serves as the United Way of Central Iowa 2023 campaign chair, vice chair of the Greater Des Moines Partnership Board of Directors, and is on the Icon Water Trails Board of Directors as well. 
Jeff, I was trying to think about your punishment. I thought, well, maybe we could change your mascot to a gecko or something. And then, and then I thought, I thought, you know, actually at our next Greater Des Moines committee meeting, we, we got you a nice pair of pressed khakis, a bright red polo. And uh, I think you can introduce yourself as Jeff from State Farm. Sound good? <laughs> Please welcome Jeff to the stage. Well, good morning, everybody. It's such an honor to be part of this uh, great event. You know, I'm a big believer that feedback truly is a gift. So what I wanted to do today is share with you a time when I received some feedback, some of the most powerful feedback I've ever received. It truly shaped who I am as a leader. And by the way, it all revolves around a root beer float. So years ago, I had an opportunity to move uh, with Nationwide from Den uh, Des Moines to Denver and took on a role leading our regional operations out there. And when I got to Denver, we were in a single story building, but we were moving to a high rise. And so when we moved to the high rise, we actually occupied the 15th, 16th, and 17th floors of this new building. And it was a great building, but when we got to the building, we recognized, gosh, our interaction, our engagement, our collaboration just wasn't the same. So we took it upon ourselves as a leadership team to say, what can we do to change that dynamic and make it a little bit more interactive within our operations? And one of the ideas we came up with as a leadership team was, well, food always works. So we, we said we're going to have some food days uh, over on the, in the weeks and months ahead. And so our very first food day uh, was on a Thursday, and um, we, we went ahead and had food on the 15th, 16th, and 17th floors. And my leadership team and I each hosted one of the various food stations on those floors. And I, along with one of my leaders by the name of Ruth Ann, hosted the 17th floor root beer float station. And that day came and went, and we just had an incredible event. Such high engagement, so much fun, I scooped so much ice cream, and I felt really good about the day. And I went home that night and I sat at my dinner table with Tracy and my two boys and shared with them how awesome my day was, how fun, you know, how fun that event had been. Went to bed excited, couldn't hardly sleep. I got up bright and early the next morning, engaged, ready to get to the office, and I got there really early. And so I'm in my office and just getting my day started, and there's a knock on my door. And I look up, and it's Ken, one of our long-term, high-performing employees at my doorway. And I said, Ken, good morning. It is so good to see you here this morning. Hey, by the way, wasn't yesterday awesome? And Ken smiled back at me and he goes, well, first of all, good morning. Second of all, about yesterday, do you mind if I give you a little bit of feedback? And I said, well, sure, Ken, come on in. So Ken came in and sat down and the conversation went something like this. So Ken looked at me and he said, you know, yesterday, that event on the 15th floor, it was incredible. We had a lot of fun. The 16th floor, it was pretty good too. But the 17th floor, not so much. And by the way, the 17th floor was your floor. And I looked back at Ken and I said, oh, for goodness sakes, Ken, I am so sorry. Did we not get you a root beer float? <laughs> and Ken said, no, I got my root beer float, but let me give you a little bit of feedback. So when I came to your root beer float station, you and Ruth Ann were engaged in a conversation. And it must have been something really important because that conversation continued on and on and on. And I grew impatient. I grabbed my root beer float and I went back to my workstation. But you know, what I came to that root beer float station for was for you to hand me my root beer float. And you didn't do that. And in the moment, I almost fell out of my chair because Ken was absolutely spot on with his feedback. I could have engaged with Ruth Ann any time of the day or night, but I didn't. I was doing it in the moment, and my job, as Ken told me, was to engage with him. My job was to thank him for doing a really good job. My job was to encourage him to continue to be a high performer, and my job was to hand him that rib your float. So my encouragement to you today is to learn from my mistake and to listen to Ken's feedback. And when you have that occasion, that opportunity to engage with your team, make sure you make them the priority. Make sure you find reasons to thank them for a job well done. Make sure you encourage them to perform at a really high level. 
and most importantly, always, always, always hand them their your floats. So, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next up is Scott Sipker, a filmmaker, and many of you may know him as the Iowa Nice Guy for a video that went viral in 2012. There's always some risk when you're introducing a comedian that you might get roasted, so I be nice. I am not a comedian. <laughs> 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 he, he started off as a stage actor at Iowa State University where he received his bachelor's degree in psychology. Scott has gone on to co-found the film company, Iowa Filmmakers, which has been responsible for the Iowa Nice series of hit videos that included a two-season run on ESPN's U ESPNU's College Football Daily. He's been a veteran actor of stage and screen, drama and comedy. Okay. <laughs> if you go over your time, you will effectively be known as the Iowa can't stay on time guy. Okay. <laughs> I've been called much worse, uh, so I guess I'm going to go for 40 minutes today. Uh, but yeah, thank you everybody for being here. About 12 years ago, I can't believe it's been that long, Iowa Nice came out, which for those of you who don't know, uh, it was a video that was defending the state of Iowa and all of the stereotypes that go along with being in the state of Iowa in a crass way that I can't quote myself today because the F word's involved. But needless to say, that video went viral back when going viral was a really big deal, uh, where it was a national news. And uh, after that, some of you have probably had big successes in your life, and then somebody says, what are you gonna do next? And you're like, oh crap, uh, I don't know. And uh, for me, I was looking, everybody said you gotta do Iowa Nice too. I don't, I'm like, I don't know what to say anymore. And I don't, the first Iowa Nice was really kind of a political video, and I thought, man, being a political commentator seems exhausting. But what if I transition from uh, politics to sports? And then I thought, well, okay, this is good, but the current people I write with don't know anything about sports. So this is where I learned the very important rule, which is to surround yourself with talented people and ask for help. In Iowa, we are, off, we are awesome at offering help, we are terrible at asking for it. And we have to change that cycle a little bit. And so for me, when it was time for me to start writing sports comedy jokes, uh, where we were gonna do a video called Hawkeye Nice and Cyclo Nice, because I know how my bread is buttered. <laughs> and uh, so I go out there, and uh, we, this way I thought it would be funny if, well, if we're making fun of any, everybody who's stereotyping us, well then we should stereotype everybody else. Thought Mark Twain would like that, and uh, I didn't. I wasn't so good at roasting people, and so I thought I'd bring into the fold. I would ask to help write because I needed help writing. The funniest man that I know, and one of the smartest men I know, and one of the best writers I know, and it's awkward because he happens to be here today. It's Nick Ronkowski. That's over there. Uh, there's Nick. Yep. Everything funny I've ever written, pretty much Nick has been involved. If you don't know Nick, he's mostly known as Liz Lidget's husband. So. Um, <laughs> But Nick and I, so, and with the whole team, we started putting together these videos and we'd make fun of everybody. And we put out a video, Iowa, our Hawkeye and Cyclone Nice, that made fun of every school in the Big 10 and the Big 12 and Nebraska twice. Because <laughs> it's so easy. Uh, anybody here a Nebraska fan? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll speak slower. That's my fault. Uh, and, uh, and so we put out Hawkeye Nice and Cyclone Nice. And I think it goes pretty well. Nick and I are pretty happy. And uh, all of a sudden ESPN reaches out and says, hey, will you, will you let us play these videos on our air? And we said, okay. Uh, and, uh, and they came back and said, those went really well. Do you think you could create original college football comedy for us every week? And we're like, okay. Uh, and, but this meant now we had to put a whole team together. And ESPN is owned by Disney. Don't report this or tweet this, but Disney's kind of a cheap company. They don't really want to pay. And so we got enough to like maybe get pizza once a time. And uh, the, the problem was is that it took about six to eight people every week to pull off those weekly segments on ESPN. And we didn't have money to pay everybody. And what happened was at the end of every episode that we would shoot, somebody would come up to me and they would never ask, What's in it for me? 
they'd always say, how else can I help? How else can I help? I think that should be the new motto of Iowa. How else can I help? Will you put that on our signs? But remember that when you're trying to solve a problem, a human being is gonna be the person who can solve that problem for you. So surround yourself with talented people and ask for help. And I really would like to just also say thank you to this person over here who's doing a great job. You're the best. You're the best saying sign language translator I've ever seen. Yes. And, and the person on the podium is really, really smart and funny. <laughs> but I, I will leave you this. It's, we made fun of a lot of people in our time. And I, I would just like to say that I make fun of Nebraska a lot. Uh, but uh, Nebraska is an incredible university. They run the read option on the football field and in the classroom. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that joke was written by Nick Rankowski. I think maybe Nick is auditioning for our uh, for a future 90 ideas for us. Thank you, Scott. All right, our last speaker to this morning is Emily Westergaard. Round of applause. <laughs> Emily is the CEO of the By Degrees Foundation. The nonpro the nonprofit partners with whole schools to increase high school graduation and post secondary readiness rates on Des Moines North Side. She has led the organization since 2010. I think maybe my one of my very first stories that I ever wrote was actually interviewing you for a, a story about the, the organization, so it's fun to see things come full circle. Before that, she worked in fundraising roles at Drake University and the World Food Prize Foundation. She volunteers for the Broadlands Medical Center Foundation Board, the City of Des Moines Housing Services Board, and the Polk County Early Childhood Iowa Board. She was a member of the 2015 40 Under 40 class, and if you go over your time, you get to dye the color of your hair blue to match your team's logo. So we'll, we'll see you around town. Please give Emily a big round of applause. I, uh, I think my punishment is going last and going after the funniest person here. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, but thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I'm going to touch on three ideas this morning. Number one, and the biggest, invest in kids and public education. Nearly everything that we have talked about today, yeah, nearly everything that we have talked about today is going to be a lot more difficult if we don't all put a lot more effort into growing our next generation of students, leaders, employees, and entrepreneurs. We have a diverse, talented pipeline of students right here in central Iowa. So identify ways that your business, or you personally, can strengthen local public schools. Advocate for stronger public education funding, even if you don't have kids or they're not in public schools. By Degrees works with businesses and corporations to introduce students and families to all the different education and career pathways that are out there after high school. And we start those conversations in elementary school, giving kids the tools they need to work towards those long-term goals. ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, invested in by degrees so that we could create programs to help our students learn about all the types of jobs related to agriculture. Central College invests in bringing students in elementary school to their campus to help them explore majors and campus activities and learn what opportunities are available to them after, edu after post-secondary education. Whatever business you're in, whatever industry, your future success is tied to public education. So invest in giving kids more options. Number two. Broaden exposure. By Degrees works at Findlay Elementary, Harding Middle, and North High School. We start taking students on college visits and career visits in kindergarten. Every year, students at our school get to experience a day in the life of a college student or learn about registered apprenticeships in the trades or shadow a doctor to learn more about clinical practice. By broadening their exposure and starting early, we help students start to identify with those future options. A fourth grader that spends the day touring University of Iowa's dental school or their performing arts center can start to believe that one day they could go there and they'll keep that goal in mind as they get older. So consider ways that you could broaden exposure with your workforce. Imagine marketing interns getting to shadow the legal team or a call center representative collaborating with the compliance office. By helping employees learn about lots of different opportunities within your company, you'll find yourself with a more aligned workforce. 
Just like one of our students who never thought that college was for them because they didn't know anyone that had ever gone to college, maybe your marketing intern is actually a really great accountant, they just never thought about it. And my third point this morning is to give shout outs. Every morning at Findlay Elementary, we start the day with all 300 students in a morning meeting. It helps us set the tone for the day, uh, provides a moment to make sure every kid and adult there hears that they matter and that they have important work to do. We also invite students to give shout outs. Shout outs remind us to be grateful and to recognize when someone does something helpful. A shout out from a fourth grader yesterday as I was there was to her friend for helping her with fractions. Another student gave a shout out to her classmate for inviting him to sit with him when they didn't know anyone at the beginning of the year. Uh, I promise you it's also a really great way to start your next day or your meeting. So I, wanna, I want you to think about ways that you could start your next meeting with a few shout outs and watch how you and your colleagues feel recognized and seen. Notice how it changes the timbre of the rest of the meeting. So we're gonna try it. I'm gonna say I have a shout out and then you'll say shout out. We'll try it. I've got some board and colleagues around here that are going to keep us together. I have a shout out. Shout out. Shout out to Chris and Emily for uh, moderating what is uh, turning out to be a really great activity this morning. I have a shout out. Shout out to my fellow panelists. Uh, I have been loving reading and writing all of your uh, notes down, and I just love all of the, the creative ideas that we have this morning. And last one, I have a shout out, shout out. to all of you for showing up today and for wanting to learn and grow and take something that you heard here and make it your own. Thank you. We have just a few minutes for uh, questions. So if you thought our incentives were fun, now I get to grill our speakers. Um, so we have some microphones available if you all don't mind um, sharing. Um, so Joshua, I'm gonna start with you. And I'd like to know from, from your transition from uh, a government role to um, your consulting role now, what's a lesson that you have learned about business? Um, so I think in the transition, uh, I still do the same work. I, I primarily work with local government and local entities trying to create opportunity and do policy change work. But I think the, the biggest thing that I've learned in anything I do, because you know, inclusion is you know, the new buzzword, I think for me, you can't be inclusive if you aren't willing to change anything. And, you know, you, you're, you're bringing people in and you're saying, hey, we want to be inclusive. And they throw out new ideas like, ah, oh, no, we don't want to do that. Oh, no, no, no. You know, you want to keep the status quo going. Um, so I, I find that if you truly want to be inclusive, uh, you have to uh, be willing to change things because we're operating in a new world workforce. And in this new world workforce, in the Industrial Revolution, it was all about survival. People trying to put food on the table, you deal with bad bosses and you deal with abuse, et cetera. Then we transitioned to the digital revolution where computers came in. And instead of uh, trying to survive, now you're trying to get a, a quality of life, a certain standard of living. But with this new generation, uh, we're moving into the attention age. And now people want to give attention. Now people want to make sure their work is worthwhile, that they have purpose in life. And so they want a quality of life, a quality workplace, an emotionally safe workplace, and a quality job that's making a difference. And in that new work, in this new world workforce, are we creating that environment where people are actually giving work? Because now they're gonna jump. If they feel like their job isn't worth something, they feel like they don't have a purpose, they're being ignored. Uh, because if you really, listening requires you to do something. Any good listener, Listening changes you. So I'll give an example. You know, my, 
my, my, my partner would say, hey, you know, I need you to empty the trash. Well, I hear you. Uh, well, you hear me, but you're definitely not listening because the trash ain't empty. <laughs> and so you have to, real listening requires you to do something different. So are we listening to what people have said today? Are we listening to what people in our workplaces are saying to create the world and the, the environment and the businesses that we truly, truly want to be a part of? Um, Shekinah. I would um, like to know for you, you talked about in the publication that um, uh, that business and effectiveness, busyness and effectiveness are not mutually exclusive. And I want you to kind of explain this. How can leaders focus on being less busy and being more effective? I think sometimes um, we get lost in the sauce, right? It's our society praises you for being busy, for being going here, there, and everywhere but how effective are you being? Do you know what your goal is? How do you measure that progress? It's not about how you can make folks feel, but are we making systemic change in what we're trying to accomplish? I think that um, it, it takes a long time to move a big ship. And so doing things with or without applause, but understanding what the goal is and how you're gonna measure that success would ensure you're making effective change versus Busy time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dr. Keck, I'd like to know from you, you went from being a first generation college student to now the president of a university. And I'd like to know, what's your advice for young folks who wanna have that kind of trajectory in their careers? Anything is possible. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, anything is possible. Uh, surround yourself with people who can help support you and lift you up. And if you can't find those people, figure it out and do it yourself. And uh, just keep going. And never, ever, ever give up. Thank you. Um, Caleb, I know you, you talked about in your remarks and in the publication, I think particularly young people, but I would say anyone, really emphasize they want to be themselves in the workplace. They want to show up as who they are. What is your encouragement to leaders so that they can enable that kind of environment? Don't be weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because someone's from a different culture, different, different generation, you all need to point it out. You don't need to be like, millennials. You hear that all the time. Like, millennials, I'm a geriatric millennial. I'm almost 40. <laughs> yeah, let that sink in when you're dizzy millennials. We have houses. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to afford houses. It's one of those things that just embracing the difference. And I talk about this with my son all the time. He wants hair like Tatis Jr. If you don't know baseball, Tatis Jr. is a, I love the dude, great baseball player. You know, he did PEDS, but we're past that. Um, but he asked, would I ever do that? Because when I was younger, I had cornrows, and my ears are pierced. And I said, I don't know, man. Like, I was not, uh, I don't know. And so that's the struggle I have. If I'm telling young people, I'm telling people be themselves, and yet I won't go back to braids, or I don't put my earrings in, it's just, it's just a dichotomy. It's finding people that support you. And I'm very fortunate, and they're gonna hate this, but my group of friends are the garbage people. They are very supportive. <laughs> uh, you can ask about the name later, but just be supportive of people. If you have a question, figure out how to ask it nicely. You know, I have the Honduran flag in my office, and someone's like, oh, what's that blue flag? That's weird, WTF. Like, that's, that's a country's flag. I'm wearing it right now. Be respectful. Thank you. All right, Liz, you talked about in your ideas and in your remarks about folks be, having time to be creators. I want to know from a leadership perspective, how can folks enable their staff to be, have time to be creators? Well, I think the first thing is it has to be more than words. So, you know, take your team out for an hour and take them to the Des Moines Art Center. It's free. You know, let them see something different, take them out of their normal environment, show that it actually matters to you, that you would invest an hour of time in it. Um, show how you actually, as a leader, are taking the time to do it. It has to be more than, I want to see some creativity out of all of you. Okay, well, but how? Share, share with them how you're actually doing that and, and take them out of their environment, I think helps a lot. 
Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Newland, I'd like to know from you, obviously with the pandemic, that healthcare has faced a lot of uh, burnout among employees, but I don't think there, it's certainly not the only industry. So I'm wondering for leaders that are facing teams that have b feelings of burnout, what are your thoughts on helping those folks want to stay with y their organizations? Uh, that's a really hard question. Um, we are all really, really tired. Um, it, it was a, a rough time and um, we're still recovering. And I think what I'm trying to do is um, just put as much kindness into our team and really to try to surround um, our teams and ourselves with um, grace and um, a little space and then bring them back to why we do what we do, why we got into healthcare in the first place. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff, um, one of your ideas was to pr prioritize fun at work, and obviously you like rub your floats. Um, I'd like to know, as, a, and as, as an executive leader now, what does fun look like for you? To me, I mean, fun is just being real. It's just, you know, being enjoying the people you're around, whether it's your friends, your family, it, your coworkers. Um, you know, and, and, and you think about it from a work standpoint, we spend actually more time probably kind of waking hours with our, our work partners than, than we do many of our, our family members. And, and you just have to make that enjoyable. So to me, it, it is, it's prioritizing it. You have to make it, make it a priority. If you don't make it a priority, work will become work. Uh, and it's something that you're not going to, to want to continue to do. I mean, uh, I do. I work now because I want to work, not because I have to. I want to, and and it's because of the people I get to be around. You know, many of our that are here today. I just I like them as people, whether it's uh, in the office or out. So I, I think just you know, trying to make sure that also you keep yourself real uh, and grounded. I mean, work is is a role that we're in, but it's not really um, to me. To me, work is not my top priority. It's an important part of what I do, but it's, it, it supports what I really want to be a part of. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Scott, one of the things that you wrote about was that being results oriented can sometimes have barriers because it doesn't make us as adaptable if things don't go exactly as we planned despite our best efforts. So I wanna know how have you kind of adapted this mindset to be able to accept things as they are? I have adapted by changing what I, changing the goal line, really. And instead of making the goal line some sort of external thing that I have no control over, it's all internal. Am I deciding to do this based off the best evidence that is available, using logic if I can, to come up with the best decision? And if that decision doesn't work out, I know deep down that I did the best that I could. Because for me at least, I don't know how it is for all of you, luck is one of the biggest factors in whether or not I'm successful. Like the fact that Iowa Nice hit, there were, I have made dozens of videos better than Iowa Nice. Uh, and they have gotten, like only my grandmother has watched them. <laughs> but for some reason at that moment in time, that hit and it changed the course of my life. I have, whether or not Iowa Nice was successful, or not, this is good, this is a good example I'll wrap up with this with is, Kinnick the Documentary, the biggest project I ever took on, uh, being the executive producer and narrator for that, took 10 years to bring it to fruition. Last year we released Kinnick the Documentary, 90 minutes on Niall Kinnick. And more people watched Iowa Nice, a two minute video that we shot with a single camera and no audio gear. And I can't, see Kinnick as a failure because it didn't do as well as Iowa Nice did. And so internally I know we did a good job and we made a film that my father would have been proud of. That's enough for me. Awesome. And Emily, I'd like to know from you, our society really tells us that kids are supposed to learn from adults but I think that's sort of a narrow viewpoint. I wanna know, since you work with youth so often, what do you learn from kids? 
Uh, I love getting to work with kids, and we work at, with elementary kids and middle school kids and high school kids, and the middle school, school kids still terrify me. Um, <laughs> but those elementary school kids and high school kids, and even sometimes those middle school kids, um, really do teach us a lot. And uh, I learn from them um, the friendships that they make and the way that I see them collaborating together. Um, they, they can get over something that happened on the playground fairly quickly. And I think that we can, as adults, really learn um, that sort of that interpersonal skill and in how a first grade class tends to work. We take turns, we, um, we respect each other, we raise our hand, we don't interrupt people. Um, there are actually a lot of things that happen in an elementary school classroom that we could all benefit from. Awesome. Well, Chris is going to come up and share a few closing things, but we're going to give you all a chance to think of a final thought to leave us on after that. All right. I think I'm going to end with a, a variety of shout outs while they think about their final closing thoughts. So we're going to, we'll see if we can do that. I'll try to work this in right. If, if I do it wrong, let me know. Um, so first shout out. Shout out. Thank you. Uh, is going to go to Jessica Meisner. Where's Jessica at? Where is she? Jessica, big wave. On October 19th, we've, we're going to have our jobs market um, outlook for 2024, uh, and she is going to be honored as the 2023 Denton's Davis Brown HR Professional of the Year. So give her a big round of applause. Thanks for being with us today. You can register for that at businessrecord.com slash events. A um, couple other shout outs that I want to give as well. The 90 Ideas publication has all 90 ideas in it. It's on your table. Please make sure to take that home with you. The speakers today touched on a variety of their ideas, but I promise you there's so many nuggets of wisdom in there. Um, my, my ritual routine is I put it next to my, my bed, put it on my coffee table. It's a fantastic one when you're feeling some of those moments where you need a little bit of that extra energy. That's the time to turn towards that. Uh, publication. So I have another shout out as part of that. Shout out. The fantastic artwork that you see on the cover that was done by local artist Laura Palmer. Laura's in the back, I think. Laura, big wave. Throughout the publication, her art is doodled all over uh, the, the, the speakers, and she took the inspiration from each of the ideas to make those pages. Um, if you liked the content today, we are going to be posting videos of each of the speakers uh, on our website at businessrecord.com slash 90 ideas. So you can find the publication if you want to share it with other folks. If you want to share the videos to help spread some of the, the word that they helped do today, please be, uh, we would love for you to do that as well. We also want to have another shout out. Shout out. I want to thank the entire events team, Sarah Brown, Stacy, give a big wave here in the front. They helped make today happen along with so many other folks that helped with the production of the magazine, Emily with the, the selection of the panelists. We get asked all the time, how do I get to be a 90 Ideas speaker? I can de definitively tell you this is not something you cannot buy your way onto stage. There's not a price, probably, that, that, you, can't, <laughs> that you can pay me uh, to get your way onto the stage. Uh, that's not something we do as a, a, all jokes aside. We don't do that as part of our events. Our newsroom um, uh, works each and every year to put together a fantastic panel. So we take nominations. So if you have somebody in the community that you think would be a great speaker, they can be from a big business, a small business, a creative thinker. They can be from all walks of life. We try to put together a really good group every single year to make sure that you're getting a good diverse group of opinions and thoughts each year. So please consider nominating somebody next spring. All right, we have just about nine minutes, which is perfect, because we want to make sure that each of you keep this to about 30 seconds to a minute with nine of you. So I'm going to give you a chance to give a final closing thought and a wrap. So Joshua, we'll start down with you. Uh, my final thought is, again, a lot of people get caught up in the activity wheel of life, just constantly just staying busy, as a few people have noted. But are you really having the desired impact? So get out of the activity wheel and really focus on what is the desired impact we desire to have on the future state of our community and our stakeholders. And that should always direct your activities and making sure that you're reaching the desired community groups that you desire to reach at the desired level you desire to reach it. But if you do that, you gotta fund it. 
budgets in a capitalist society are moral documents. It decides what is most important to you. And just being good, uh, being a good person is not enough. You have to develop good systems because good intentions get suffocated by biased systems. Thank you. Joshua, I'm going to give you one last, one last thing. One of the very first times that I talked with you, I think it was the first time you, you talked with me about, at the time, I think Pokemon Go was the big, big thing that was distracting everybody. I wonder if you'll remember that. But you, you told me about that and said, what's going to be the next Pokemon Go that distracts everybody from what they need to be continuing to work on? So I'm, I'm curious, uh, at this time and, and place, after the last couple of years and all the momentum that's been going on, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about um, how to stay focused as we go forward. How to stay focused? Man, that's a good question. Well, first of all, TikTok is the Pokemon <laughs> Go, right? So everybody's on TikTok. If you're not, you somebody showing you a video. Um, so I would say, how do you stay focused? Number one, you look at the world outside your window and decide, is this the community that I truly desire? And if it's not, you get involved uh, in organizations. I'm a big proponent of local government. By the way, local government uh, when the president makes an announcement, we've given out billions of dollars to this, this, and that. The president has no idea where that money's going. Uh, they send it down to your local cities, counties, and schools, and they decide where that money goes. And if you're not involved at a local level, which most of you uh, probably don't attend city council meetings. Uh, I got in trouble for saying this once. Go, go to a city council meeting. <laughs> but um, uh, but, but if, if you... If, if you're not involved at a local level, they send that money off to their buddies, their pals, their friends, and your communities and your neighborhoods miss out. So you have to be involved at a local level because federal government's about to have a shutdown. Most people will never feel it. If local government shut down, you feel it in about five minutes. Somebody come fix this traffic light. No, no, you, you'll feel it <laughs> instantly. And so you have to be involved in your local community because all politics are local and you have to make sure that you're involved looking in the world outside your window, playing an active part between the polling, between the voting, that civic engagement to shape the community that you desire to have. Thanks, Joshua. All right, Shekinah. Building a better way is everybody's responsibility. I wanna be clear on that if you are breathing it is your responsibility to build a better way. And not just professionally, your home environment, whatever that may be, provides you a, a spring in order to be great outside of that space. And so I would, when I'm challenging us to build a better way, know that that's a personal thing and a professional thing. Don't negate the folks in the, the home life because they can make it bad for your public life too. So love them all and build a better way. Thanks. Dr. Keck. Well, as you think about the future, I'm sure all of you realize that we have a lot of change that's swirling around us and that will continue to swirl around us. And you can take control of how you react to that change. And one thing I would recommend that I didn't talk about in either my remarks or in the book here is do a time audit of your life. Ruthlessly eliminate the irrelevant. You all are busy, busy, busy people, but we have a lot of work to do, and that requires time. And time is the one commodity that none of us can buy, none of us can replace, and none of us can find more of. So ruthlessly eliminate the irrelevant. Thank you. <laughs> Caleb? Treat life like baseball. As the batter walks up, they've got the walk-up music, they pick out their, their song that hypes them up, but they also don't worry about strikeouts. When you think about strikeouts, it's more failure than success. When you think about slumps, we all get in slumps. Don't dwell on the slumps. And I'm talking to myself, you know, whether it be imposter syndrome or just getting wrapped up in a project. Try and be like Julio Rodriguez. He's always going up there, he's gonna swing. But even if he strikes out, he goes back to the dugout and he's still super happy. So be like the, the batter in um, Julio Rodriguez. Liz. Passion is contagious. We've heard so much about authenticity and being real today. I I've think the most successful in life is when I have been able to talk about the things that I truly care about. When I talk about art, my 
face lights up. It's what people are attracted to and what I'm attracted to when I hear other people talk about their passions. That's what I want from my team. It's not even that they necessarily have to be passionate about artwork. I want to hear what their passions are about life. It's amazing the way that people will be attracted to you and your light when you share your passion with the world. Thank you, Liz. Dr. Krish. So I would just remind everyone, notice yourself, notice others, and be okay with your frosted flakes. <laughs> All right, Jeff. You know, one of my favorite books is, it's called The Go-Giver. And, and kind of the, the punchline to the, the book is, the more you give, the more you get. Uh, back and, and I think within our community, it's really important that we all give. Um, we've got a number of nonprofits represented in this room and across our community that absolutely need us. They do so much to keep our community together. So my encouragement is give um, your time, talent, and treasure, and I guarantee you will get back more than you ever thought you you gave. I have, uh, as a public speaker, I, I get a lot of practice at, uh, at telling my own story. And uh, some of you may think, well, that was practiced. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, it is one of my passions when I meet with some of my video clients and they're struggling. What sh we, we know we need video content, but what do we fill that content with? And I say, you got to tell your story. Because if you don't tell your story, somebody else is. So whether you're a business or an individual, you have to tell your own story. Because if somebody else does, they're just not going to do it in a way that you're going to like. Or you can just pay me to do it. All right. <laughs> oh, and I nominate Nick Rinkowski for the next event. Thank you. <laughs> Emily, wrap us up. All right. Um, I just want to uh, talk briefly about the fact that the, when you think about what is the most predictive measure of a student's long-term success. It's not actually how smart they are, or what their test scores are, or who their teachers are. It is their zip code. Their zip code is what is most predictable, or what helps predict where they will go in life. So By Degrees is out there trying to change that, as are so many other organizations. But if you also want to get involved personally or professionally, um, reach out, and we want to talk and uh, work together to make sure that zip codes don't define outcomes. All right, got a, one more shout out. Shout out. All right, thank you to Denton's Davis Brown and our supporting sponsor, Broadlands Medical Center, for helping support today. We really appreciate each of you for being here today and helping support and being able to bring everybody together. So thank you. Give them a big round of applause. Got another shout out. All right, this goes to Connie Weimer and the entire BPC team, and that's because we're going to be celebrating our 20th and 40th anniversaries. Can we give a round of applause? We're really proud of that. We're a locally owned media organization. We're working each and every day, and our team is working each and every day to be able to help provide you the news and the information that you can use to help make your business better, your organizations better, and our community better. So we're gonna be celebrating on December 13th. Look for some more information on that coming to your inboxes here very soon. And lastly, one final shout out. Shout out. Let's give the panelists a big round of applause today. I'm Chris Kodesky with Business Publications. If you need anything, we're always here to help. Please feel free to reach out my way. Have a great rest of your afternoon.